tigers and lions and empathy? Yep, we're going to deal with Tiger King on the Think Christian podcast because there's no such thing, even a phenomenon like the bizarre Netflix series, as secular. I'm Josh Larson. Welcome to the TC Podcast. The late film critic Roger Ebert once described movies as empathy machines. When a film is really working, it takes you out of yourself and you can identify in some way with the people on the screen, he said. That empathetic experience, I think, can make you a better person. That notion should ring true for Christians. Our faith is rooted in the person of Jesus Christ, fully God who became fully human, lived as we do, and died on our behalf. So we look for and value expressions of empathy in the world around us. And today we're going to see if empathy is exercised in two new pieces of pop culture. Tiger King, Netflix's documentary series about the sordid subculture of private zoos in America, and never rarely, sometimes always, an independent film about a pregnant 17-year-old facing momentous and difficult decisions. Before I bring on Claude Acho and Sarah Welch Larson for those conversations, a quick reminder that as COVID-19 continues to dominate all of our daily lives, we're here to take your prayer requests. TC's parent ministry, Reframe Media, we have a prayer team. So we get requests from readers, listeners across our programs, and gather those and send them along to prayer team members. So if you have anything you'd like us to pray about, COVID-19 related or otherwise, Email us at tcpodcast at thinkchristian.net. That's tcpodcast at thinkchristian.net, and we'll be sure it makes its way to our prayer team. Claude Acho is going to help us get things started here. He's a brave man because he accepted my invitation to watch and discuss Netflix's Tiger King for the podcast. So my first question, Claude, is are you okay? Have you recovered from the experience? I am in recovery. I'm, I'm currently <laughs> in the phase of recovery, and you know, okay. I think uh, I'm gonna need I'm gonna need some time. I believe it. I understand completely. I'm gonna give you the honors here. Of most people are probably well familiar with Tiger King by now, but I'm gonna give you the honors of describing it just in case someone has only vaguely heard about it. How would you describe this documentary series? So Tiger King, it's a seven-part documentary series on Netflix. It focuses on sort of under-the-radar world of big cat zoos, so tigers and lions. And specifically, it focuses in on a troubled man who goes by the name of Joe Exotic and how his desire to really be the top player in this sort of underground world of cats, to be the Tiger King, so to speak, how that desire spawned all sorts of problems and chaos uh, in the lives of many uh, human beings and animals, and really how that desire spawned out into some really troubling rivalries with other people in that industry, eventually leading to a conspiracy for murder and some things that come to follow in the episodes, some turns that you don't necessarily see. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's why we're kind of talking about this recovery element, because there is so much here that you don't know you're getting into from just a basic description. And you allude to some of that. The series actually starts when we first meet Joe Exotic. He's on trial at this point for planning to murder a rival, this animal rights activist, Carol Baskin. So then it kind of backs up and retraces his story. A troubled man is a very kind way of putting it, I think, the more we get to learn about him. Because the series is, you know, on the surface about the big cat industry, but then we learn about the role that drugs come into play. It touches on polygamy, sex cults. I mean, pretty soon the animals are forgotten. And my experience with this is basically I hit a wall about episode four. And this is the episode where we get a lot of the internet TV show that Joe Exotic would put out there, including one where he has this doll meant to resemble Carol Baskin, and he shoots it in the head with a real gun. So at that point for me, you know, the show had kind of gone past trying to understand these people or this world really, let alone raising any awareness about the animal rights issues at play. And it had become purely sensational. So it sounds like you had a harrowing experience also. Was it a better one than I had, Claude? Or what did you make of it now that you've been through the whole thing? <laughs> you know, honestly, I was going to stay away from the show just from the bits and pieces that I had sort of caught. And, and part of it is sort of the countercultural vibe that I can carry sometimes out of being pretentious, you know, seeing something <laughs> that everyone is watching. So I'm like, I'm not going to watch it. You know, okay. people are too lowbrow. So there's definitely part of that. So it's not all virtuous by any means. But, you know, I could smell it enough to know that 
this seems like spectacle for the sake of spectacle. But when you reached out, I uh, obviously love what we're doing at TC. So any chance really that I have to be a part of conversations, I think are really important. So I I, I, I really pr- uh, prize and privilege those. So, so I was like, you know, let me jump in. And, you know, my thoughts were definitely confirmed, though. I think I came away from this really disappointed, I think, with how the documentary was portraying these people. And I think there's just, there's a lack of humanness and a lack of reflection in some of the ways that things are presented. And so I think in this case, you know, I want to be fair, you know, the story is sensational. It is a spectacle. It is something that is just something you just couldn't see coming. You almost couldn't even think of this on your own. If someone were to tell you to come up with something ridiculous and troubling, be hard to top this. So I understand that by telling the story, it's going to be sensational. It's going to be a spectacle. But I feel like if a story is so much of a spectacle, I feel like as creators or storytellers, you have to compensate, sort of dial up the knob of reflection and dial up the knob of how to present these people in these situations, not as just something that's going to be mindless entertainment that is actually sort of soul shriveling, but that you're going to raise some questions that can, not to redeem the characters necessarily, there's some heinous things done, but for viewers to at least think in meaningful ways about what we're seeing. And I feel like that was lacking. Yeah. Yeah. And as far as, you know, to the point about trying to avoid it and maybe asking the implied question there, like, why didn't we just avoid it? Well, for one thing, it was such a sensation, but also beyond that, as we were kind of thinking about this show based on empathy, I thought this was a really interesting test case for even if it didn't capture a sense of empathy that we wanted to talk about, maybe it's a test case for what something is not able to express it, what that looks like. And sometimes it's helpful to look at those things as well. So the more I got into it, as I said, yeah, it really did seem to be missing out on the sort of things we hope for or look for in an empathetic piece of art. And, you know, as Christians, of course, we base that understanding on Jesus as the model of empathy. So not only the way he personally interacted with people in his time on earth, but just the fact of the incarnation itself, of God becoming human, that being the ultimate empathetic gesture the idea of literally walking in our shoes. So with that in mind and looking at something like Tiger King, I wonder, sounds like we agree. We didn't see it necessarily in there. Did we see a way, as you were talking about turning up the dial, I like that as a metaphor. Do you see any hints of that or a way this documentary could have made that move? Maybe one that comes to mind for me is an example. This is relatively late in the series, one of the last couple episodes, but we get footage of Joe Exotic when he was younger. It might have been near the beginning of his owning of the zoo, and he's talking about his intention to help these animals, to kind of be more of a rescue or a shelter for them. You know, he talks about that later, but you can tell it's definitely part of his sales pitch, and we've learned about his business practices that it's blatantly false. But here, in this older clip at the beginning, We get a sense that maybe this is a man who did have good intentions but became corrupted or made corrupt choices along the way. I'm wondering if you saw anything else like that in the series or just kind of to continue with that idea of turning up the dial you talked about, did you see any ways the filmmakers might have been able to go in that direction? I definitely agree. I think that reflective piece from Joe that comes at the end, I think that's in the last episode. I think that's actually like one of the last things that happens. And so that was definitely one of those moments. And it just felt like, oh, where were more of those? I think part of the question is we are introduced to so many characters that are in the orbit of Joe Exotic or Carol or even Jeff Lowe, some of these different characters or um, Doc. And part of my question was, who are these people and where are they coming from? You know, they're like, and why are they going to these places? Why are they doing these things? What's driving them? What are they running from? What are they running toward? All of these questions that don't get answered. And I understand you can't answer those for every single person in your documentary. But for some of these major people who are, you know, leaving family in California and coming and ending up working with Joe and staying with Joe and like living there for 10 years, why? Why do they keep working with this person when they know what's going on? And, you know, some of those side characters or kind of smaller roles in the documentary, I think are those places where they do have a voice of sort of reason and perspective. And so hearing their story, you know, hearing their reflection could have been some of those moments or even, you know, understanding a little bit more about Joe in terms of his background and his childhood and his life. I think we get some real small moments of that, but not much. I do think, you know, to give some credit, the second episode, 
about this cult aspects of these zoos. You know, there's a young woman who is interviewed and we do get a little bit of her story and her perspective and what she was feeling and what drew her there. And I feel like that was actually, you know, for as depressing as that content was, I think that was one of the episodes that was the strongest because it did show that, you know, this is a human being going through these things and how are we to reflect on that? Yeah, that's right. I, I had forgot about her because she only does show up in the one episode, I think. And that's right. this is, she had worked for a number of years at a different zoo that was run, as you're saying, essentially as a cult. I mean, the, the people who were vulnerable were kind of brought in and then almost, they could leave at any time if they wanted to, but this is where they were getting their lodging and their food and ostensibly a form of care. And she does get out and talks about it in retrospect. I think that is another good example. And your description of so many figures in this documentary series points to a structural problem I had. I think that's absolutely right. The direction of this series almost seems to be more about, you know, you talk about babies being, you know, attracted to a shiny object and just suddenly looking another way. It's like this series just, whenever there was another strange person for whatever reason, and these people are all interesting, you could say, strange, you could say, it's like it gets distracted by them. And it's like, oh, let's follow this person for their strangeness. But we're only interested in their strangeness, not their story. And once we've gotten the strangeness, we kind of move on to the next strange person. So I just didn't think the structure itself was very empathetic. You know, I had a good conversation on Letterboxd. I know you're familiar with Letterboxd, Claude. Basically, kind of a social media site platform, but also a website where you can log what you've watched and rate it and review it and stuff, and people can comment. So I did just log that I'd watched Tiger King and had a good conversation with Nate Gass. He's the co-host of the Can We Still Be Friends podcast in the comments there. And he had a little better experience with Tiger King than you and I both had. And he was kind of asking me, we were talking about this question, you know, how might it have been more empathetic if I indeed thought it should have been? And the only way I could really explain it was pointing to another documentary, a feature documentary that I think does do a good job of this. And it's called Minding the Gap. A couple of years ago now, and this basically followed some young men in the skating subculture of Rockford, Illinois. And how their lives all separately kind of were touched by domestic abuse in different ways. And one of these figures, these main figures, who we come to feel like we know pretty well, we also come to understand he's abusive to his girlfriend. But the way the film frames his story, we feel empathetic for his situation because we come to know those things you're talking about with the peripheral figures in Tiger King, Claude. We come to know what formed him. We come to know the context he's in right now. And so without absolving him of the abhorrent behavior that we witness in the documentary in Minding the Gap, we still recognize him maybe more as a broken human being rather than a freak. And Tiger King seems more interested in the freak qualities. So I'm wondering if there's anything like Minding the Gap, a movie or a TV show that comes to mind for you, Claude, where it's kind of the flip side of Tiger King or our experience of Tiger King, and you can see it as an expression of empathy. So one thing that comes to mind immediately on that is A Wire, the HBO series, long sort of drama looking at all the structures that are happening in Baltimore. It's actually gotten a lot of, I think, new attention in light of the pandemic as people are looking for things to watch. And, you know, for those that hadn't seen it are coming around to it. The Ringer is actually doing a sort of rewatchables podcast series about it. But I think that is a show that does not absolve people of their wrongs and their faults and their misdeeds, but at the same time portrays them in human ways with empathy that you can begin to understand what's happening. There's in particular one scene in which Bodie, a young man who is on a corner dealing drugs, actually has lunch with McNulty, a really flawed but brilliant police officer. And they sit down and have lunch and they talk throughout the whole series. It's a really a microcosm that you realize there's really not a major difference between those on the corner and those in the cars, you know, solving cases, solving murders and arresting people. You just see the humanness. You see both the beauty and obviously the intense brokenness. And so I think that show does that really well. And then I got to give a hat tip to a last black man in San Francisco. The way the guys on the block were portrayed in that film is just beautiful and human and dignifying. And so that's something that I had seen recently. So those would be my two that I think, you know, they don't hide. We're not asking for heinousness to be hidden or downplayed or to be, as you said, absolved, but to see the fullness of a human being. Yeah, so a couple of recommendations there. A few new ones if you're trying to recover from Tiger King. We've got Last Black Man in San Francisco, The Wire, and Minding the Gap. Well, hopefully this was helpful, Claude. Anything else would help you get it out of your system that we should talk about before we wrap up with Tiger King? 
Well, you know, <laughs> I don't know if I can undo this, but I'm hearing rumors of a movie. So, you know, that just means you may have to encounter this again. I'm not the movie man that you are. So oh, we'll, we'll yikes. see what happens. I, we'll I what happens. really, really hope you're making that up, Claude. <laughs> The internet has a lot of rumors, so who, yeah. who knows how true these things are. Let's hope not true at all. So as I mentioned, Claude, you are on Letterboxd. Is it just under your name? Is that where people can find you if they want to? Yeah, just my first and last name. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's a really fun site if you haven't tried that out yet. So also wanted to mention for listeners, if they still want to do some Tiger King processing, we did write about it on the TC website. Karen Swallow Pryor actually wrote about this one. Her post looks into how we might watch such a show in a way that loves our neighbor as ourselves. So Karen had an interesting take there that you might find helpful. Again, that's at thinkchristian.net. Claude, I will see you on Letterboxd, I guess, and I'll also talk to you again soon for the podcast, all right? Yeah, looking forward to it. Tell me how do you feel, partner? I want the truth and not a lie. I want to know. That's what I said. I want to know. Tell me how do you feel, partner? I want the truth and not a lie. I want to know. Because if you feel good on the inside, I must admit you're a much better man than I. I want to know, I want to know, I want to know. Would you feel happy or would you feel sad when you've lost the best girl that you've ever had? I want to know. From all the way back in 1959, that was none other than Ray Charles with Tell Me How Do You Feel, an R&B classic that gets awfully close to both rock and roll and country, if you listen close enough, and reveals one of the most important roles popular music music has played ever since, well, maybe since the invention of the long-distance dedication. Sometimes songwriters, like all poets and artists in one way or another, give us normal people words when we come up wordless. They help us express the feelings that we just can't get out on our own. Other times, though, artists act more like listeners. They seem to be sitting there on just the other side of the speakers, communing with us through our joys, our questions, our pains, as we sing along. They seem, at least, to be listening to our feelings when few others are. I loved it when Ebert called movies empathy machines. Although I would argue that movies and all other forms of entertainment art can also create calluses where we should be tender and can numb us to things that should be shocking, meaning these empathy machines don't always or even often work like they're supposed to, but the design is there. Music is much the same. We love to listen to songs about loneliness and heartbreak or new love and triumph because those emotions create a sort of harmonic resonance in our own hearts. It's electrifying. It's also scary if we're not careful. Hi, John J. Thompson here, up here in the booth, spinning virtual records and setting the mood for yet another podcast. I've compiled a list of 23 songs up down, empathetic, and oblivious, all tied into this theme. In addition to the full track of that excellent Ray Charles song and a classic Tom Petty tune you'll hear a little later in the show, we've got Nina Simone, Courtney Barnett, R.E.M., Gladys Knight, Sleeping at Last, Beyonce, The Who, Fleet Foxes, and more. To listen along, just search for the Think Christian profile on Spotify and follow. You'll find this episode's list on the latest episode currently, but it's also got its own mix separately, and you can hear all of the mixes I've curated for the podcast there either individually or in one massive archive list, which I must say makes for some fun extended listening. You can also find the links in our emails and on Twitter. And if you think of any great songs that touch on the theme of empathy, tweet at me at John J. Thompson and I'll see what I can do. Until next time, this is JJT saying, I feel you, man, really. Happy to bring in Sarah Welch Larson. Fellow movie fanatic, fair to say. And so, like me, Sarah, definitely missing the opportunity to get into movie theaters. They've been closed for over a month now as we sit here and record this. So, I know you would hang out quite a bit at Chicago's Music Box, probably other places. No longer possible. How have your viewing habits changed in these last couple of weeks? What have you been watching? How have you been watching it? A decent amount of streaming movies, quite a bit off the Criterion channel, actually. And then I've also been watching a lot of Babylon 5. I'm very much with the times okay. <laughs> with the 90s science fiction. Well, yeah. Now, you know, for some people, this is a good chance to catch up on some of that stuff they've missed. I've been watching older stuff as well, older films, but also trying to keep up with new releases as I can in this new situation. And one of those is the indie drama Never Rarely, Sometimes Always, which is written by 
Eliza Hitman, who also directs. Normally a movie like this, never rarely, sometimes always, it would open in just a few cities, some art house theaters probably. But because of COVID-19, it's been made available on demand. So just about anyone has access to this small indie film. And I think that's a good thing because I think this is an important movie. It's not something that's diverting or escapist at all. And I know some of us are looking for that sort of stuff, but it's still very much well worth your time. It's moving. I found it challenging, features incredibly rich performances in it, and it's just really well made by Hitman. So the story here never rarely, sometimes always follows a pregnant 17-year-old named Autumn, played by newcomer Sidney Flanagan, who travels from her rural home in Pennsylvania to have an abortion in New York City. So painful topic here, a divisive one as well. And while we could get into a conversation about the moral and political implications of this story, there's a lot of stuff pertaining to that in here, I mainly want to talk about Never Rarely, Sometimes Always within the context of this idea of empathy. I'm curious, Sarah, how did the movie strike you as an exercise in empathy? This idea Roger Ebert put out there that movies can be empathy machines, is it fair to apply that notion to something like Never Rarely, Sometimes Always? Yes, in just about every aspect of the movie, honestly. I thought that the performances were empathetic. The writing was intelligent about addressing the emotional reality of its characters. And this intelligence also stretches to the cinematography. It's a very understated-looking movie. The color palette is kind of washed out, which makes sense. It's winter. But this is also a movie about a teenage girl who has her armor up and who is trying desperately not to betray just how vulnerable she is to the outside world. The camera work does this also, too. There's some handheld camera, but it's not shaky cam. It's more like slightly jittery camera. It feels almost like watching someone who has anxiety but is very good at hiding it. And Quite often, the camera also follows this main character, Autumn, who's played by Sidney Flanagan. It follows her eyes throughout everything that she's doing. It doesn't really focus too much on anything else around her. It mostly just focuses on her face and on her eyes, and it recognizes that she's thinking and she's processing what's happening to her, but she's not going to let on about what it is that she thinks about the world around her if she can help it. Yeah, and that's the real feat that this film does pull off is, as you say, the performance, Flanagan's performance as Autumn, she does have her armor up and she's not really letting us in. But empathy is all about being able to place yourself in another person's experience. So the performance isn't doing that in some ways, definitely in the first hour. I think I want to get to a moment when it does do that. But you're right, the filmmaking does. You know, without being showy, the filmmaking expresses itself in empathetic ways where we start to understand, get hints of the emotional world that Autumn has been living in and experiencing without telling us even, you know, how she became pregnant or any of those sort of biographical details in the narrative or explication. In the filmmaking, we start to feel for her and start to feel what it is like for her to feel, I think, is the distinction. Exactly. Yeah. And I think that's one of the movie's great strengths is that it isn't interested in airing any of Autumn's dirty laundry. It's not interested in any of the sordid details or anything like that. It's just interested in getting us into the same headspace that she's in without necessarily knowing all of the context. And I don't think we need to know the context. All we need to know in order to understand this movie is to be able to understand how she's feeling. And I think this movie succeeds in that. So the performance does shift, I think, for me at least, when it's about an hour in when she has arrived in New York City. She has found her way to this abortion clinic, and Autumn is sitting in this office with a counselor played by Kelly Chapman, who gently guides her through this intake interview, and eventually they get to questions about Autumn's past sexual relationships. So what you're speaking about here, it could be the moment for dirty laundry airing, but that's not necessarily what this counselor is interested in either. She's interested in her health now and going forward, how she can assist Autumn in understanding what she's been through and maybe get to a better place. So this interview in it, Autumn is asked to use one of the words from the movie's title, so never, rarely, sometimes, always, in response to a series of questions, very personal, uh, very difficult questions like, has a partner ever refused to use protection? Has a partner ever been violent? 
Have you ever been forced into a sexual act? And Hitman, the director, lets this portion of the scene play out in a single take. So the camera doesn't leave Flanagan's face for almost a full five minutes. And we do just watch this armor you've described, this face she's been presenting slowly fall away. And there's something incredibly sad, but also freeing about what happens in Autumn's face. She's relieved of a burden in a way by being able to share some of this experience to a limited degree with the counselor. What I at least came away with was, again, not any of those details, not any of the facts, but more about how fraught this young woman's experience of sexuality has been, and really ultimately how little of it has been in her control when you hear how she answers these questions, which is just despairing. So I'm I'm curious what you made of this central sequence, Sarah. I also get the impression from this scene that this is the first time that Autumn has been seen by somebody else on a deep and personal level. And I think this is part of the reason why she breaks down is because she recognizes that this is the first time that someone else has seen her and isn't going to reject her for anything that she's done. This counselor only cares about her well-being. And that's an incredibly powerful feeling to feel seen and then to feel that love and then to have to stand up under it as well. And that is a nice way of describing the biblical story that I wanted to bring into this, actually, which is Jesus' meeting of the Samaritan woman at the well in John 4, because watching this scene with Autumn and the counselor, that definitely came to mind for me. This is when Jesus is traveling through Samaria, stops at a well, and meets a woman with, I guess, many red flags, you could say, according to the cultural norms of that time. I mean, one of them just being that she's a woman in public alone, and so as a man, Jesus shouldn't be talking to her. Also, she's a Samaritan, and he's a Jew, and most Jews would never even consider having a conversation with a Samaritan. And also this dirty laundry of her own, in a way, which Jesus being Jesus, he's well aware of. Uh, He tells her, you have had five husbands, and the man you now have is not your husband. So he knows who she is, what her life has been like. Yet rather than, you know, turn away, or vehemently condemned, the first thing he does is sit near her, and this is going to sound familiar to what you were just describing, right? Sit near her, invite her into his full attention, and get to know her. Get to know her individually as a particular person with a particular story. And that's just such a beautiful model for us, I think, this model of listening to someone who he's expected to despise. He's not ignoring her past and its difficulties, but he's also not allowing it to define her or her future. And ultimately, the conversation there when he says, I am the truth, is to help her point. He's helping to point her to a better future. Is that a stretch, Sarah, to say that the counselor and never rarely in that interview kind of follows this model? I know there are a lot of complications going on here that make it an imperfect parallel. So I'm not arguing it's a one-to-one, but I wonder if there's something there in the movie about what our beginning posture should be when we're meeting others, about letting empathy be our first move, maybe, as it was for Jesus. Yeah, in that sense, I would say that that's not a stretch at all. And it's funny because I think that more than anything, when we're talking about empathy, we're talking about the ability to step into the shoes of another person and to understand their context and where they're coming from, even if we may not necessarily agree with all of their decisions. And Christ did that by becoming a person (laughs) and a human being. So I think that it absolutely works. Yes. For sure. Yeah. And so I think that, you know, in that moment, it reached out to me most powerfully in being this expression almost of Christian empathy. Were there any other elements to the movie that kind of supported this idea of it being this empathy machine for you that you wanted to bring up? I feel like for the most part, the movie succeeds 100% by focusing on Autumn and on her cousin, Skylar, who I think is played by Talia Ryder. There was actually one point where it didn't work for me, and that kind of threw the rest of the movie into relief. There's a scene in a bowling alley where the two girls go to a bowling alley with a boy they don't know very well, and for a moment, the camera leaves the focus on these women's faces. And for a spot second, it takes the position of the boy that they're with. And the camera focuses on Skylar's rear end. And for that moment, I just felt so jarred because it felt like it was a removal from the empathy and a removal from 
the feelings of these particular young women and a step towards what most movies honestly do with the male gaze. So I found that piece actually a little bit frustrating, but it also threw the rest of the movie into relief because the rest of it was so focused on them and on their experience. Yeah, I can see what you mean because it definitely does break this aesthetic model that had been set, this path that it had been set, which is key, as you described well at the beginning, to evoking empathy. I guess what it did for me beyond that, though, was also giving us a direct eye view as to the world of men that these young women have been negotiating all their lives. So way at the beginning of the film, they both work at a grocery store together, and we see that at the end of their shift, they have to take the cash from their cash register to an office in a back room and through a window slide the cash underneath to their manager, we assume. We never see his face. But when they do that, he always grabs their hands and like tries to kiss their hands underneath. And we see that this is a nightly routine they have to deal with, this sort of sexual harassment. And I guess that camera angle in the bowling alley is the equivalent of that scene at the beginning if we had been on the other side of the window. And it would have been maybe a little more predatory So I think when we get that point of view in the bowling alley, everything has kind of started to snowball and ratchet up. And they've had more experiences like this. I think of the guy at the subway who almost exposes himself. And I guess maybe that's why Hitman might have chosen to push that predatory POV a little bit further. But I also see what you mean about it breaking that empathetic perspective it had been holding up until that point. Yeah, yeah, I think... It just felt like it was just a step just past the edge. And as a young woman myself, I see that point of view in so many other movies that it was refreshing to watch a movie that didn't have that point of view. (laughs) Point taken. I can understand that. Yeah, there's plenty of that out there. So (laughs) if a film doesn't need it, better for it not to be in there. Any other thoughts you had about Never Rarely, Sometimes Always, before we wrap up here? Honestly, I loved it. It's one of my favorite movies of the year at this point. And it's not a movie that I probably would seek out for comfort, but at the same time, it was comforting to know that there are people out there who are making movies that are focused on the small and the unseen and the underseen Mm. in a way that is empathetic and compassionate. So, Yeah, you get the feeling that Autumn is the sort of young woman who most people in her life don't notice unless they kind of have to or have to deal with her. She doesn't speak about this to her family at all. We're given hints why that would not be a good idea for her to do. And so that this life-changing, harrowing, wrenching, painful decision she makes, she's having to do without being seen in almost every moment and with no one coming to meet her and understand her and ask, what has your life been like up to this point and how can I be here for you now? So yeah, in a way, I don't know you know, if hopeful is the word to put to the movie, but there is something inspiring about seeing her get to be seen at least momentarily compared to what she's experienced for most of her life. Well, yeah, you're right, Sarah. I don't think, you know, it's not going to offer the sort of relief that a lot of us are looking for necessarily in our viewing. I've been doing that too. I've been watching Nailed It and I've been watching World's Most (laughs) Extraordinary Homes, you know, laughs and (laughs) peace of mind. But Difficult Life continues to go on, you know, challenges outside of the coronavirus. So I'm glad that we do have movies like Never Rarely, Sometimes Always to help us think about ways to meet others as people of faith. So thanks for checking that film out with me and take care of yourself and stay healthy, okay? Thanks, you too. Well, let me get to the point. Let's roll another joint. Turn the radio to laugh. I'm too alone to be proud. And you don't know how it feels. You don't know how it feels to be me. I came to Tom Petty late. 1989's Full Moon Fever was the first Petty album I owned. So feel free to discredit my opinion. But Wildflowers, I think, is maybe my favorite album of his. And that's where you'll find that track. You don't know how it feels. The late rockers plea that no one understands him. Now, we've all felt that way, made that claim. The good news of the gospel is that it offers a response in the one who not only walked in our shoes, but took the terrible path we deserved and walked it in our place. That's the ultimate expression of the sort of empathy Tom Petty is asking for. 
it may not be reflected in something like Tiger King, I think never rarely, sometimes always, probably comes closer. Even if you disagree with the ultimate outcome of that film or some of the decisions the characters make, still, its, it's understanding of the young woman at the center, Autumn, is empathetic in a way that's instructive for all of us. John J. Thompson found that perfect Tom Petty track for the Spotify playlist he compiled to accompany this episode. You can find You Don't Know How It Feels and a whole bunch of other songs by searching for the Think Christian playlist on Spotify. Thanks, John. And thanks also to Claude Echo and Sarah Welch Larson. We mentioned Claude is on the movie diary website Letterboxd as Claude Acho. Well, Sarah is there too as Sarah Welch Larson. And you can find me. Josh Larson. Just to keep things straight, Sarah is L-A-R-S-O-N. I'm the Norwegian, L-A-R-S-E-N. You can follow TC on Facebook and Twitter as well. Just look for us as Think Christian. And if you want to send us feedback or prayer requests, those can be emailed to tcpodcast at thinkchristian.net. If you know of somebody looking for new podcasts in this time of COVID-19, maybe their favorite sports podcast has gone dark with no new games, would you mind mentioning the TC Podcast to them? We could also use some new reviews on Apple Podcasts, so if you use that app, just scroll down on our show page, even as you're listening, and you can do it right there. The Think Christian Podcast is a production of Reframe Media, a family of programs designed to help you see your whole life reframed by God's gospel story. Visit reframemedia.com for more info. Our audio engineer and post-production supervisor is John Reeder, and Reframe's co-director overseeing content strategy is Robin Basselin. Thank you very much for listening. We're going to get together again soon to consider how another aspect of our pop culture fandom connects with our faith. And lastly, a note of thanks to the Communication Arts Department at Trinity Christian College in Palos Heights, Illinois, which provided the recording space for this episode. Learn more at trnty.edu. And go Trolls! Trolls!